Hello, everyone. So today I'm joined by Yaron, who is one of the co-founders at Salesflare. So Salesflare is a simple yet powerful CRM that automates your data to help build better relationships and make more sales. It's also been the most popular CRM ever on both Product Hunt and AppSumo. So Yaron, I'm really excited to have you here. Welcome to today's show. Yeah, glad to be here. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for jumping on. So today we're going to be talking specifically about some experiments that you've been running recently with mm -hmm. your onboarding process at Salesflare. So how you've gamified your onboarding system to help increase trial to paid conversion by 5%. We have loads of other cool numbers too, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit later on. But before mm -hmm. just jumping like straight into to what you guys have been doing, maybe you could let everyone that's listening to this or maybe watching this right now, give them a quick insight into Salesflare and where you guys are at as a business at the moment. Yeah, so uh, Salesflare is a, is a sales CRM for uh, B2B businesses, mostly small and medium-sized businesses. We have over 2,000 companies actively using the software. This is mainly agencies, soft, software development agencies and marketing agencies and other types of agencies as well, like events agencies, just, just any type of agency you can imagine. And on the other hand, we have a lot of tech startups and fast-growing startups of all kinds, quite some SaaS companies on there as well. And the way we differentiate with other CRMs is that our CRM is act actually based on existing data. So it's not primarily a manual system like most other CRMs or almost all others, actually. It's really a system that sits on top of your email inbox, your calendar, your phone, social media, company databases, and all that. <coughs> and it uh, makes it very easy to extract that data and organize it. So it offers it to you and makes it very easy for you to curate it, you could say, which makes that companies have and, and end users, salespeople have much less work uh, filling out the CRM, which makes that it doesn't fail like it does in most cases because people always inevitably... Uh, Stop using the CRM at some point. It's very easy because basically, if at any point you lose your discipline, you will start missing out on data. The CRM is not full anymore it, and the data does not fully make sense anymore. And then it becomes less useful and then you will start inputting less data. And then at some point it's just a stop. And additionally, we also make it a tool that really helps with following up sales. That's a frustration I had years ago with Salesforce. And still the case, Salesforce is not really a tool which you follow up sales. So it's also a, a big reason for salespeople to use the CRM. So the input is very easy. But if, if it is very easy, what do you get back? So we, we minimize the input and maximize the output to make sure it really helps you in your sales process. Was that always like a conscious decision from the beginning when you first started as to like identifying that, hey, one of the biggest problems with CRM softwares and just sales process in general, right? Is that that challenge of just keeping it up to date is like a job in itself. Like companies, like some of the enterprise companies that we work with, they have people whose sole role is to manage Salesforce or manage their HubSpot data. Smaller businesses, agencies, or, or anyone else, as you said, if you don't keep up with the input of the CRM system, like I'm guilty of doing this in the past also, like if you don't keep that pace going, then you just stop using it and then it doesn't work out too well for you. So was that always a conscious decision from the beginning when you decided to build a solution like this? Of, okay, we're going we're gonna to make it as easy as possible to utilize, but more importantly, make sure that people are getting actually good results from their CRM instead of it being like a, an afterthought of, oh no, I have to update the CRM after every single call yeah. or email I receive. So that's the, that's the very initial idea we started with. So if I would show you the very first presentation I made, uh, that's what's in there. It says CRMs are failing because basically, so a CRM is, is supposed to be something with which you can um, tend to your customers and follow up your sales in a better way. And to make that work, you need to track the data. And if you don't do it, then it's very hard to sell at scale. Uh, then you need to rely on your memory and your memory can only take so much. So you will start forgetting things uh, like forgetting to follow up people at the right time. You will forget what you discussed. If it's in a team, you might not know what your colleague is doing. You have no idea. You, you don't have the overview. You don't know what's coming. You don't know how much sales you're going to make. It's all a blur. So a CRM is supposed to change that. Now, the, the big tragedy is that most CRMs don't change it. There is a big promise because it's a system. And if the system is used in the right way, then uh, it will work out. 
and everybody sees that, if the system is used in the right way, then it will work out. So lots of sales managers do things like making the commission of salespeople dependent on whether they fill it out or not. Or they have weekly or bi-weekly sales meetings where they like, go with the salesperson through the, the, the sales funnel and basically update it together. It's not a very useful way of spending your time, except for the part where you discuss what next steps are, maybe that part, but updating the CRM, why? So when I did customer interviews six years ago, people accepted that state. They were like, yeah, it's training, it's forcing the salespeople, it's making their commission dependent on it. Those are the solutions. Software cannot get better, they said. And I said, yes, I think it can. I think you can make software in such a way that it disappears. Like we're used to in many consumer um, applications that the software does all the work for you. You don't do that much and it helps you in some way to organize something. But in CRM, nobody thought that was a thing. So we started thinking about this. We thought, well, it, it is possible. I must say it took us a while to make something that people uh, appreciated and that did all the things we had in mind. And uh, making a CRM system is, is much more work than we, we had initially foreseen. But now after six years, at least, we are uh, in a state where we can, we can compete quite well with all of the big uh, incumbents. It's mainly a matter for us now of, of getting traffic to us. With, with all the players out there, that's a bit harder. But product-wise, we're doing very well. Very happy customers. Very, um, the use is very good. If you Somebody told me that a Salesforce executive told him that about 20% of Salesforce licenses is used. In our case, 90% uh, of our revenue comes from active customers. So the, the, the chance in, of churn is also way lower. And we don't charge people for, we don't take money from people who don't get the value, let's say, or at least very little. So that's something we're super happy about and something uh, we keep working on. And, and the onboarding experiments are an extremely important part in that as well. For 2020, at the beginning of the year, we decided that one of our focus uh, areas for this year would be uh, consistently improving the onboarding. And that's not only because onboarding gets more people to use your software successfully. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, drop the successfully, perhaps, get more people to use your software. But it's also, uh, them, it really helps to, to make them successful on the longer term as well. We've been looking at data. And what is that people who get set up better during the trial in the very first weeks on your software, at least for us, they are much more successful in the long run. While people who just uh, signed up with us uh, because they really liked it and then uh, we had a call and they say, I'm immediately going to subscribe. Those are the first ones to churn. <laughs> so. And so we'll get into the specific experiments in a second. First, I want to ask you, so you just said, for example, you identified that people who who are like more active within the very beginning of their trial and more actively mm -hmm. on and everything else, they stick around as customers longer, which makes total sense. How do you go about, for, for anyone that's listening that's maybe like a early stage SaaS business or, or someone at the point where you guys are at, um, when they're looking at their onboarding sequence or their onboarding process even, how do you, like, where do you begin before even starting these experiments? I'm interested to, to know from like how you guys did it, where you begin to like, to collect data as a starting point, what do you what do you look at, and how do you how do you set the scene as to okay, this is where we are now, and these are some of the triggers that we're identifying. What was your process yeah. like? For you? uh, it it changed a lot over time, I must say. It's been in the, the the first years almost entirely driven by taking customers through the process. Uh, so in the beginning, you almost have no data. Running experiments makes absolutely no sense. Statistically, we're at a point now where we can do some statistics. Mm -hmm. I would still like to have more data, but in the beginning, you have absolutely nothing. So what you need to do is take people by the hand through the whole process, be there with them. Maybe not take them completely by the hand, but at least be there when they, when they do it. Very concretely, you get people to uh, book a call with you. You demo the product. You see where in the demo things fail. Then you say, okay, are you convinced with this? And, and what, what stuff they want, the questions they ask, all these kind of things. 
then you transition to, do you want to set this up? I can help you with that. You want to do this now? You want to do this later? Maybe you book another call. Maybe just continue your call. Then you do that. While you're doing that, uh, always keep something to write because there will be a lot of embarrassing moments that you want to write down very uh, quickly uh, so you can go out after that and, and solve them. You basically, for us in the beginning, you we had to connect your emails uh, and a few other things. It was very manual. Now that's just a click, but back then that was, was complicated, the IMAP settings and all that. Then I would set up things together with them, make sure that the processes sales-wise that I had in mind, we would set up in, in the CRM. We would find things that weren't possible. We would find ways of doing it, all those kind of things. And along this way, you support them and all that. You start finding out what it is that you will need extra, what things you need to tweak, where you need some more explanation. You know, all those kind of things are best learned being very close to the customer. And then... As you do that, step by step, you can start solving these things. The most important ones first. Uh, when you go about prioritization, you need to make a good model for yourself there. That makes sense. What we currently base our model on largely is the impact it's going to have on the different parts of our funnel. And we have a formula that then calculates what the business impact is in the end. And this is from like, are, are more people going to get on a trial? Are more trials going to convert? Are, are, are more trials going to be active? Are more of these active trials going to convert? Are more of these paid customers stay with us? Is this going to impact our support uh, positively or negatively? Both are possible. <laughs> All these things we try to map. And then based on that, have an overall business impact measure that we can then use to say, okay, this really needs to be fixed first. We also have a, a vision alignment factor next to that. It's a bit of an arbitrary thing uh, to pull into the formula, but it helps us to develop things that are aligned with where we want to go. But then along the way, you can start tracking more data. When you can do experiments, it's super interesting. Probably you'll never get uh, to the scale of Facebook very fast where you can run uh, 10,000 versions of your product and just see where your metrics improve. But you can do this kind of A-B experiments. Always good to accompany those with a Hotjar or whatever other platform videos, because then you can also, not being there with the customer completely, still also see how it looks like beyond the numbers that you've been tracking. And interviewing customers about things you've, deployed or things you're testing next to that is uh, super helpful as well because again there there might be more things that you'll discover yeah that's awesome thank you so much for giving such a clear insight as to the process for people no matter what stage they're at let's talk about some of the tweaks and changes that you guys have made recently then because it sounds like you've had some really some really um, positive results from what you've been running with the kind of experimentation with your onboarding flow. You told me that you've been like gamifying your onboarding a lot. Do you want to, how do you want to structure this? Do you want to just go straight into a few of the different things that you've done? Or do you want to give an overview first as to like how you, how you've started to gamify? Cause I have four or five different stats that you've shared with me around like mm -hmm. more tracking customers, people inviting more team members, et cetera. So maybe we could go, depending on where you want to put the attention, maybe we could go on like step-by-step step through a few, of the, a few of the things that you've introduced. Yeah, I can guide you to experiments that we've done. I'll, I'll leave the gamifying one, to, one for last. So the two things that we were looking at was one, how can we make sure that people can actually see the product before they create an account? And then the other one was like, how can we get people on the track of getting set up in a proper way? How do we make these two things happen? So on, on the first one, which is internally, we say uh, walk through before sign up, uh, so or before connecting emails. Our intention there is to show the product without you having to connect your emails. Now, th the reason is there, uh, we made our sign up very easy and it immediately gives you value and there's no need for email verification because you sign up right away by connecting your emails. And at the moment you connect your emails, Salesforce will start synchronizing emails. It will start finding contacts. 
calculate connection strengths, find email signatures, get social profiles. And you know that all starts working from the moment you sign up while you're going through the walkthrough, all this happens. That's obviously very interesting, but also has a disadvantage and that there's people that don't like to connect their emails uh, right away. So it blocks some people from signing up. And what we also noticed is that a lot of people uh, actually want to compare CRMs by just having a look at them. Mm -hmm. Actually, when you look at people trying out our product about, uh, I think 60% does not really use the product. They just click around. So we wanted to make that easier as well uh, without them having to necessarily uh, creating an account. What we did uh, is, and actually we still have the experiment running today. It depends, of course, when this episode is going to go live. But when you go to our website right now and you click sign up, either it will lead you to a screen where you uh, connect your emails or it will get you into the walkthrough. And what it does when you go through the walkthrough is it will show you Salesflare as if you're already in an account and it will show you the different parts and it, sh it will show you how we create value for you right away, but also guide you through how this is how you should probably use Salesflare. And this walkthrough ends with you uh, dragging your opportunity uh, that, that you created from the lead stage to the one stage and then fireworks and all. And then at that moment, we will pop up a screen that says, okay, now you want to keep using Salesforce. Then you need to uh, connect your emails here. And when you do that, it very naturally lands you in Salesforce, still looking the same, but then actually you, you have a real account. So it's a transition that as a user seems very natural, but actually it's a total switch, which makes that you can then continue your journey with an account. Did, did you or your team have any hesitation before implementing that? Because I'm, I'm interested because I know like when I think of our clients at Hey Digital, like the SaaS companies that we, we paid marketing for, obviously it depends on the company and the way that their founder's mentality is or their CMO's mentality is. But a lot of these companies that let's say, and I'm interested to get your thoughts on this too, but a lot of companies who maybe have raised funding or significant funding and have a VC firm behind them. They're so pushed tightly on sign up volumes and sign up numbers. I know it's not always the best, like it's not the best metric to look at, but I know that those people, if they hear what you just said, they'll be like, oh shit, there's no way I'm ever doing that. And yeah. then I know there's some people that will be scared about doing that, even though as you've said, if someone goes through that process, I, I just had my, I just went, I, I just opened up incognito in my Chrome because I, I tried to do it on your website and it took me to the email sign up. So I went incognito to see what it's like. And I can see if someone walks through that first, like my assumption is the sign up volumes may be slightly lower. I don't know. We'll find out in a minute. But those people who've been through that are going to be much better. Like I would imagine more engaged users and more engaged people will lead to longer customers and stuff like that. But I know that a load of people will hear that, like hear what you've just done. I know you haven't shared the numbers behind it yet, so that might change things, but people will hear that and they will be freaked out. I know they will. So did you guys have that feeling too when you thought about introducing this? Were you like, oh, well, it we might be this kind of uh, naive entrepreneur types who always see uh, opportunities rather than issues. I don't know. Or it maybe helps that we don't have uh, VCs on board who put high expectations that we need to hit every month that we're super afraid. But no, I, we didn't have much hesitation there. We, of course, tried to make it uh, the nicest experience possible. But when we see the experience and we feel comfortable with it, then we believe in it and just try it. What you said is right, though. We, we had less trials since we... Like, actually, we do A-B testing with Google Optimize. And then based on that, the, the place where you end up changes. And we see clearly that from a website visitor... To trial sign up, uh, the conversion drops with 11%. So it's a pretty bad hit that we take there. And initially, we didn't even properly track it further than that. Okay. So we, our data, when we looked in our database, it didn't properly track from which of the versions that people would come. So it, we actually lost some data there and we had a moment that we were like, is this working or is it not working? But then we implemented some more tracking uh, and based on uh, about two months of data, I can tell you now that the 
trial to paid conversion of these trials is actually 40% higher. So we lose 11 on the visitor to trial, but then from trial to paid is 40% higher, which if you then multiply these things, 0.89 and 1.40, uh, you get to 1.25. So 25% higher conversion from a website visit to a paid customer. So we consider this based on current data uh, because we, again, we don't have uh, Facebook volumes to have super accuracies, but we, so far we consider this a success um, and we're going to, we're going to keep seeing how we can get this even better. We might guide people from the beginning in a sort of different flow. We're not sure yet, but it, this at least seems like a, a successful experiment. Yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. Okay, cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's super interesting because I, yeah, like that, it makes sense when you say it out loud, but I just wanted to ask a couple more questions around that because I know that people listening are just so scared to try things like that sometimes. So it's, yeah, uh, yeah it's good. It's good to hear this. Okay. And so what else? You said you had a second, a second. A second uh, so that's the gamification, the, the setup guide. So we made a gamified setup guide. Initially, our inspiration was from the people at, who What's the company? It's a product management software. I forgot the name of it. It's the, the same people are behind this product management organization that does conferences and all. I, I forgot. Anyway, we, I, I, I read a blog post from them where they said, like, we gamified our, our trial length. So based on the setup steps you would take, you would get a different length of a trial. And uh, I shared that with the rest of the team and they were all like, wow, that's really exciting. Yeah, that's cool. should try that. Now we didn't copy at all what, what they did. We started thinking from, from our own software. We had a sort of an article on our how-to site, which is, is how, this is how you set, set up Salesforce. These are different steps. So we started having a, having a discussion internally about what is the sequence of the steps they should take? What are the important steps and what are the less important steps? So which ones should be incentivized less and more? And we came up then with days and we couldn't throw too many days at them because then we would make the, the trials excessively long. So it was uh, uh, tinkering about it a bit. And then a big part of the work was really thinking about how the setup guide would then also be very neatly integrated into the software so that it would actually also work and not be just some kind of, yeah, how can I say, totally separate thing, which would not really help you to, to set it up. Now, f f four reasons why, perhaps, just to frame why we did this. Salesforce is a CRM. It's, a CRM is a, a bit more work to set up. It's not like some other tools where you just go in and, and just start working. And although we have that initial walkthrough that I talked about earlier, many people after the walkthrough, it's a feeling like, okay, this was nice, but what now? Mm -hmm. you no, know, you get in the software and then, mm, and no. So we wanted to guide there. Second, we show initial value in the walkthrough. And then we have some, this kind of pop-up tips in places but they don't really help discovering more of the value of Salesforce, actually really using Salesforce and setting it up. That's when you discover more value. So we want to guide people through that as well without us having to be there necessarily. We like to be there, but when people can do it themselves, that's so much easier. We wanted to incentivize specific behavior as well. We tried doing chat messages in intercom, for instance, automated, like if you saw that it's a big team, like saying, hey, did you know you can invite people on the trial and stuff like that? That's is one way, but we want to go deeper there. And the fourth reason is we saw in our data that what I said before, the better people are set up, it's not only that the conversion is going to be higher, but also the churn is, is lower in the long run. And I actually did an analysis after we decided on the days and stuff per step. I started doing a statistical analysis on the data we already had previous to, the, to, the, to implementing this setup guide to see how, if we didn't incentivize these things, how different setup steps, if you did them during the trial, how it affected one converted trial to paid, uh, and second, whether they were still paying or not, so that we could then slightly revise the amount of incentives we gave if necessary. 
Now, I cannot show the setup guide here now, but I'm going to make you imagine it. <laughs> so after that whole thing where you get the walkthrough, connect your emails, you land on the opportunity screen in Salesforce. So you see your pipeline and the bottom left, there is a window opening up squarish that has a list of setup steps. We define 12, but the first and the last one are not really setup steps. The first one is start a trial and you get seven days for that. <laughs> so that's the seven days you start out with. And the last step is uh, subscribe to Salesforce with which you get unlimited days. You know? uh, but then there's uh, 10 actual uh, setup steps in between and they are in a, in a logical order. And you can just click on the, the, the second one, basically. And what it does then is this sort of squarish setup guide becomes a minimized version where you only see one uh, step. And at the bottom left, there's previous and the bottom right, there's next. So you can flip through it. Now, this stays there while you, on the rest of the screen, you can do whatever is required. It's explained. There's a little icon for an article and there's a little icon for a video and you can check these out if it's the video it just opens uh, in the screen and you can just close it again and it goes back and when you then complete the setup step our software knows live instantly and the the setup step completes so it visually says completed and it moves to the next one and then you can just click that again it again goes to the right place in the software where you can complete the setup step cross it off next so it really feels very interactive uh, in the way that you you complete stuff. Additionally, we built in this extra mechanism that every time when you complete a step, a notification goes out to your whole team um, mentioning who completed the step. And it basically says, Dylan, Dylan just earned seven days for the team. Yay, with a little icon. So to create a happy feeling in the whole team about that as well, if they're already with multiple users on the software. That's awesome. Did you like the implementation? Because it sounds, as you said, it's a very, I don't know if organic is the right word, but it's like a very natural process within Salesflare, like when they're setting everything up, like all of that sounds like it fits in very well. It doesn't seem, it doesn't take them off anywhere. It doesn't seem like clunky or challenging to go through. Was that difficult to implement? Did you guys use like a tool to support with that? Did you build out something? Like, did you build that into the software yourselves? Like how, how did you go about that? The the walkthrough I talked about earlier, we, we use Shepherd somewhere for, for, for adding pointers to on things and tips and but in this case, now for the setup guide, we fully it's basically like a feature we built. We find it so important that we we don't wanna rely on whatever other people offer that you can just build in. Some of these companies might tell you like, Oh, but you spend a month or two months, maybe a uh, FTE working on this. Why would you do that? You can just buy it and it only costs that. That's indeed, it could be cheaper by just taking something off the shelf, but the effect both short and long term would definitely not be the same because what we built is, is really part of our software and it actively helps you and it really properly incentivizes. Well, whatever we would get off a shelf, and I, I don't think it even really exists yet in any of these onboarding softwares, would only do the job half off and we would wait for some new features to appear now and then. We just prefer to make really core things because this we consider core yeah. uh, ourselves. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And then, so we only have a couple minutes left and then we'll have to wrap up. So what was the impact of introducing that to the business and how, how long have you been doing that for? Also, I'm interested. I, we have it live now for uh, almost five months, but the, the last time I, I pulled some data, plus I cannot take the, the most recent data because then people didn't complete their, their full process and all. So I have uh, data from May to July, so about three months of data. And the highlights from that is first, about 17% more teams start tracking customers in Salesforce. Uh, this for us is our North Star metric. Uh, so it's the most important thing for us. It's what indicates whether people use the trial or, or and the software or not. Uh, so that's a, a very important result for us. Secondly, 50%, 54% more teams actually invite team members now during the trial. 
that's actually when I did this analysis that I talked about earlier is very indicative of whether people subscribe. But I think it's probably the most indicative factor when it comes to churn. Mm -hmm. When people work together on a CRM, they're way less likely to give up versus when they're alone. And at some point they're like, ah, the sales is a bit less and then the chances are much higher. Then if you look at how well the setup is during the trial, as I said before, the, the better they get set up, the lower the churn. I don't have churn figures yet because it's all too recent and I hope people don't churn this quickly. <laughs> but the people complete now on average 6.3 of these 10 setup steps, like the 10 real setup steps, instead of four that before we, we launched it. So let's say they get 63% set up instead of 40% set up. And in the very short term, based on data we now have, it's less dramatic, but still a good result. Our short-term trial to paid conversion went up with, with about 5%. So definitely a very good business impact. Although I suspect that much more of the impact will be seen on the longer term versus the short term. Yeah, for sure. That's the challenge with some experiments like this sometimes, right? Is you need to review the data in a year or a year and a half or something to really know. But I think everything that you've shared so far, it's like, it's, it's very clear that it's had a positive, a significantly positive impact. It's now just seeing like the longer term, how, how, how long that continues on for too. Because mm -hmm. in theory, based on the way that your product works and everything that you've said, like the results will get better over time when we start looking at the impact that it's had on churn and and everything else so yeah that's awesome like thank you thank you so much for coming on and sharing this so thoroughly today too because i think it's when people come on and share step by step what they've done in some experiments for for them it's really useful for people who listen in or watch this sometimes it's it, it's like challenging to know where to begin or where to prioritize you can be trying and like, for example you said one of the one of the reasons that you first this first, this idea about the additional trial length for example first popped up was because of a blog post that you read so maybe there'll be someone that listens to this that has a similar idea that then um iterates on it slightly and has has really good results for them too so thank you for coming on i really appreciate it and uh, yeah it's been great to learn a bit more about how you guys have approached things at sales flare and, and what you're doing to to keep pushing the business forward so thank you so much for, for joining me today i really appreciate it